Okay, welcome, hi folks. Um, today I'm gonna do another video on, on the sense of life and uh, uh, my motivation for this video is also the discussion about the number 42. And I did a, ver uh, a, a video in German and I do like this video very much. And But it was not mainly about 42, it was about the sense of life, but uh, so... And I always do videos spontaneously. I, I have to be in the right mood to do a good video, and so I, I never plan videos. And so let's try and uh, yeah. But first, I don't want to talk about the number of forty-two. Let's talk about the sense of life first, because yeah, it's it's not really a, <laughs> a really deep topic. It's it's something superfluous, but. Uh, because a lot of people talk about it very superfluous and so it's not that interesting of a topic, sense of life, but let's talk about it. So, first of all, the sense of life, <laughs> if you discuss about the sense of life, you see the sense of life, it, it has to do with fruit and it has, it's something personal, it has to do with your personal life. So, uh, first of all, it has to do with your fruit, with the fruit of your personal life. And because if you have an apple tree, the, the cool thing about the apple tree is the apples you can eat about it. And the cool thing about your life is the love that flows out of your heart. No, And the people that enjoy you as a, as a human being, that's the cool thing about your life. All the people that are happy about you. And so you cannot separate discussing the sense of life from your own life. It's a, And if you see those philosophers discussing about the sense of life and the first question he did ask, well, what's the fruit of your life? How do you la live so you think you can talk about the sense of life? What gives you the right to share your opinion on the sense of life? So let's first look at your life because you say you have something to say about the sense of life. So I, I, I ask you, how do you live? And it's yeah, recently I saw some guy, he was a, a brain researcher. Oh, I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> this, this just makes me laugh, you know. I, I, I don't listen to guys like this in, in matters of, of wisdom or of life. If some guy, he proves with his life he's just a fool, he's just going after money all his life. He's just go, going after reputation. And this guy, he's talking about wisdom or even about the sense of life. And people listen to a guy like this. And this makes sense. A guy who only goes after money and, and re reputation. And you listen to a guy like this about the sense of life. People, this is foolishness. This is total foolishness. And so if you talk about the sense of life, you have to prove your fruit. You have to show your fruit first before you talk about the sense of life. If you talk about something that important like the sense of life, you need to make sure what you're talking is not rubbish, and in order to make sure, you need to live what you talk. You need to prove in your life that what you say is the truth, it really is the truth, because your life proves it's the truth. That's how you get authority and power in your words, otherwise it's just blah, 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 blah. I know everybody... Everybody's gonna listen, everybody's gonna applaud, but it's just blah blah blah, no? So if you, and if you speak the truth, not everyone is gonna applaud. But it doesn't matter. So, okay, let's come back to the sense of life, and first of all, the sense of life, uh, there's some very important scripture in the Bible about the sense of life. And I, I think it's in Mark 10, and there's there's a young lad, he's coming to Jesus, and he asks Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus, he, it says there, and Jesus started loving him, and he told him, one thing you lack, take everything you possess, and sell it, and give it to the poor, and come and follow after me. And you people, you, see, you can philosoph, you can make philosophy about this scripture a hundred years. You can discuss well, how, why did Jesus tell exactly this, and what's the problems, and and why do we do this, and why do we do that, and what did Jesus really mean when he said this? But 
You don't have to philosophize about this, you just have to do it. And then you're the most happy guy on this planet. It's, it's easy, it's not difficult. And Jesus said, then you will have the treasure in heaven. And you will have this treasure. It's not a, a thing about to discuss about. It's a thing to do. And you see, the sense of life, it's not something to discuss about. It's about doing. It's about listening to your heart and following your heart. And not about listening to your brain and discussing hundred years. If you discuss a hundred years, well, should should I give my my possessions to the poor? Well, well, I, I'm doing a little bit. Well, should I do it? Well, shouldn't I do it? And that's what the young man lad did. He he went away and he was sad and he kept kept on discussing instead of following his heart. And so. Yeah, you see, in, in order to be a, a, live a happy life, you need to live a life of faith. The Bible says the, the righteous lives by faith. And faith, it, it takes courage, it takes swimming against the stream. If everybody says, you're crazy, you're crazy, this is stupid what you're doing, exactly this direction you need to heat, and that is faith. The Bible said, curse is the man who trusts in men, Blessed is the one who trusts in God, who trusts in his, the voice of, of his heart. And so, yeah, and the purpose of life is a lot about faith, and it's also about money. Because, so, because you cannot live out of faith if you are a hypocrite with money. If you, you see, if you, if you don't believe in eternity, if you have no faith and no hope for eternity, all that remains for you is 80 years on this planet. That's all that remains. You, you, you just have this, those 80 years on this planet. And because you just have those 80 years, that's the paradise you're going to get. And so if you only have those 80 years on this planet, this planet is not paradise. This, this planet is garbage. There's so much evil in this planet, it's ne it can, never can be paradise. It's garbage. It's, it's mere garbage. And so you have to try to make paradise out of that garbage. That's what you have to try. If you just have those 80 years, there, nothing remains but making paradise out of garbage. And how do you make paradise out of garbage? You have to go for money. And money is also garbage, so you have to go for the garbage to make paradise out of garbage. You have to go for the garbage, and you go for the money for the garbage money. And that's the only thing that remains. You have to go for money. You go for money, and you go for money, and the end you're only after the money, and you love the money, and that's all you love, the money. Because you see, if, if you only have those 80 years, and you want to make paradise out of those 80 years, you, you have to serve your ego, and ego will be your God, your ego. And the logic of the ego is, if I want to have paradise, I need luxury, I need pleasure, and that costs money, so I need money. That's the logic of the ego. And so that's what you go after. And Jesus also says, he said, you cannot serve God and money at the same time, you can't. So you can... You can uh, put this verse on, on the other side. You can say, either you serve God or you serve money. Either you have to serve God or you have to serve money. One of those two. Because Jesus said you cannot serve the, the two of them. So one of them you have to serve. And so, because with the money you need to build your paradise in those eight years. And only if you can let go of those eight years... Only if you can say, well, I'm going to have paradise in my next life because I live a righteous life, because I strive after righteousness, because I care about the poor people in this world, because I try to be a blessing in this life. I don't try to have a paradise in this life. I try to have be, a being a blessing to this devastated, poor and desolated world. I try to be a blessing for this world and I'm going to get the reward for it in the next life. And then you can let go of this life. You don't need to be a rich guy in this life, but you will be a happy guy. Because you have a hope that is stronger than any anything you can imagine. Because your hope, you know I do righteousness now, 
and this gives you such a strength. Because the truth is powerful. There's nothing as powerful than the truth. And it will give you such a power in your heart. Even though you're a poor guy, you, you're a, everybody say you, you're a crazy man. You, you're stupid. You, you're giving your money away. You're totally stupid. The world says you're stupid. But you have such a power in your heart. Because you are living the truth. And there's no, no nothing more powerful than living the truth. There's nothing more powerful than the truth. You can have faith as a mountain if it's not the truth, this faith doesn't have power. But if you have faith like a mustard seed in the truth, you can move that mountain. It's not that much about faith. It is about faith, but it's more about the truth than about faith. And in order to have faith, you need to live the truth. And so, and so, um, well, yeah, and, and so, uh, the sense of life, it ha it's something, it has to do with power, it has to do with truth, it has to do with authenticity, authentic you know, what's the word in English? Authenticity in German, to live an authentic life. And an authentic life is a life of truth, is a life of responsibility, is a life of righteousness, a life of loving God. A life of loving, broken hearts. Because yourself, you have also a broken heart. If you if you walk this way, you're gonna have a broken heart. You will you're gonna care about someone who's on the street and who's homeless. You cannot walk by there and just go to your work in the bank. If you live a life of truth, you care about the guy that's on on the street and sleeps on the street. And this also has the effect that your heart also gets broken. Not only the guy on the street has a broken heart, but also your heart gets broken, and you love the broken hearts. And so you serve the, the, the suffering in the world, and, and so you also suffer. And so, uh, you see, there's no true authority without faith and without suffering. There are two ways to gain authority in life. One way is faith, and it doesn't matter if you believe in God or not. This is always like this. Also, if you're in a, in a job, you grow through faith. Like you do some job, you practice this job, you grow in faith, you grow in practice, and through the practice, you grow in faith. You trust in yourself, you can do this job, and I'm a master in this job. And through this faith, and through your words, you are a master in this job. And through the practice, of course. The faith, need, the faith it, you cannot just take the bones. Like the faith is like the bone, and it also needs flesh, it needs the words, it needs your practice in the job. And so with the bones and with the flesh, you're a master in your work, but the bone is, is the essential thing, so that your faith, first come, comes faith, and then comes the flesh, you know? And this is also true for spiritual things, for miracles or whatever, you know, or supernatural things in your life. It doesn't work without faith. And, and uh, yeah, so, uh, and the other means of growing in authority is suffering. So, through suffering, we get a broken heart, and our heart is the most important thing. So, we need a heart of faith, and we also need a broken heart in order we love this broken world. We need to love this broken world to grow in authority, and so, to, through suffering, we get a broken heart ourselves. So, that's also a, a means to grow in authority. To grow in love if our own heart is broken through, through the things we needed to suffer. And so, even though suffering is something terrible, it's also something very precious. And I did suffer. I had uh, 14 years of mental illness in Switzerland. And today I go and preach in prisons and I preach to a lot of people. And I tell people that the most hard time in your life, later on this is the most precious treasure in your heart. Because you know how it feels to be in a prison. You know, I know how it feels to be in a mental hospital, to have no hope anymore. I was three times on a bridge to jump down. I do know how someone who is suicidal, how he feels. And this is something very precious. And only you who know how this feels really can heal the heart of a person like this. Or maybe someone else, he can also heal that heart, but, but you can heal it best. You have the most power to heal a heart like this. And this is so precious. 
You cannot learn this in a university. You cannot pay to learn this with money. It's suffering is something very precious. And you see, there's a lot of worship music on YouTube, and and I love right worship music. I do love it. It's there's beautiful worship music from white people. Beautiful music, but if you have a depression, if you're really in the low in a low place, there's nothing like black gospel music. There's nothing as wow, this is really doing good to my heart. And there's nothing like black gospel music. And why is this? The white people they never had to suffer. But the black people, they have been discriminated, they were the poor guys, they had to work hard to get anywhere in their life, and they have broken hearts. Those people have broken hearts, and out of the broken hearts comes this music. And it's so beautiful music if you're also suffering, if you also have a broken heart. There's nothing more beautiful music than black gospel music. It, it just goes into your heart. And it lifts you up. And if there's no hope and you don't have any hope, you just listen to one gospel song of Sam Cook and it just lifts you up. Hey man, I have to play you some music. Let's let's go for it. And let's listen to some Sam Cook. I, I don't know you folks, you know Sam Cook. It's he sings the uh, the Don't know much about history, don't know much about biology. And he has beautiful music. And even you can discuss if he was a good Christian, he had a lot of women and everything. everything. But his music is so beautiful. And all the black gospel is beautiful music. I think you know what I'm talking about. No? So let's play some Sam Cooke. Just wait a minute, I have him here. Sam Cooke. Um, let's play that song. Wonderful. And this, this, this music, it just goes into your heart. And this is because those people, they suffer. And they are authentic. If they talk about the sense of life, it comes out of a heart that has to suffer, that has to suffer, out of a, a heart that knows what pain is. And a, a, so a person like this, this is something different than a philosopher who makes philosophy about the sense of life. It's something totally different. A philosopher who has zero authority talking about the sense of life. Zero authority. He has no power, no strength about talk, to talk about this topic. It's hypocrisy, nothing else. And now, uh, let's hold on the music a little bit. Now, we, uh, this is about the practice. You see, wisdom is always connected to life. It's connected to, to what you live yourself. You cannot preach about wisdom and you don't live the things you preach. It, it's, it's pointless, it's senseless. It's, wisdom is not intelligence. Intelligence you can learn in a book. You can read this book all your life and you're very intelligent. And you know all the theories of all this world. But if you don't practice it, it's not wisdom. Wisdom is only that what you live, what you, what you talk. That is wisdom. And wisdom you cannot learn in a book. You cannot study Buddha or the teachings of Jesus, even the teachings of Jesus. If you only study them, it's not wisdom. In order to have wisdom, you need to serve people. You only can grow in wisdom by serving people, by living what you believe. Like this you grow in wisdom. And so, wisdom is something totally different than intelligence. And so, um, uh, so if we talk now about the theory about this 42 stuff, no? I, I see there's a lot of jokes about this 42 stuff. People say, well, the sense of life is 42 and, and they're so happy about it and they're so, so happy and they make so much fun about it. Well, the sense of life is just 42. Douglas Adams, he was such a cool guy. And folks, I, I love Douglas Adams. He was a, such a cool guy. I love this book, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Like all of you folks. We all love him. We all love this book and he makes so funny jokes about God. And I think also God loves this book. No, he, God God, he, he's a funny guy, God. He's, not, he's, he's, also, he's also someone to fear, but he's also funny. God, he, made, he made funny animals. He made parasolsos. He made, he made the, the ostrich. God made funny things. He, he, God is not someone who doesn't have fun. He, he, he created fun, and he, saw, he, he likes to have fun. God is uh, 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 someone who loves life. 
Jesus, he went to to weddings. He he had party a lot. Jesus, because he loves life. Because that's what he that's what he created. He created life. He created this planet. So we can have fun. We we can enjoy life. Otherwise, he should he he need, don't need to create life. No, if God was a guy, he hates life. He don't needs to create it. No, he he's a lovely guy. He's he's a guy who loves life. He loves to have fun. So I believe. God, he also loves this book about from Douglas Adams, but maybe he's also a little bit sad about this book because because he gets mocked a lot because of that book. No, maybe he's also a little bit crying about this book because it had consequences. Of course, people that were mocking God a lot and everything. So maybe God also shed some tears about that book. You see, God, he's that's that's the thing. If we don't have responsibility, we can laugh a lot, but responsibility. The Bible says, "With with wisdom also comes grief," and because God, he, He's the guy, He has the most responsibility in the universe. He has to take care of this whole planet, and every flower, every child that dies, it hurts God. And so, I don't want to be God, man. Eh? Just imagine, you have to take care of every flower, of every child who dies. You have to carry all this pain in this whole planet, and that what, that's what God has to do all day long. He has to carry all the pain of this whole planet. He has to suffer with every child that is suffering, and that's what God does. Since thousands of years, He's suffering with all the suffering in this world. I don't want to be God, man. I, I do suffer in my life, but that's just enough. The thing I have to suffer. But imagine God. He suffers with any one of us, with anyone who is desperate, who is who uh, is hungry, and He's suffering with us. And so, yeah. But He also enjoys life. He loves life. He loves us also, and He is happy that we are here on this planet, even though all the suffering. And so he's also happy about Douglas Adams. He also loves Douglas Adams, no? And <laughs> Douglas Adams, he, he's so cool. He, he he was writing this book, no? And I don't know who, uh, what what relationship he has with God. He probably he studied philosophy in the university, and he learned a lot of things about God, no? And so he 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 also knows well about the question of sense of life, purpose of life, no? And so he writes about this, and he wants to make fun of it. And instead of writing, well, love is the purpose of life, or God, or something like this, he thinks, well, let's write something totally stupid, not something. Let's write something totally stupid, and and he thinks and thinks and thinks. What, what could it be the most stupid answer to that question? And then you see the Holy Spirit is walking by, and he says, well, that was that. And why you don't just write forty-two? And then some, wow, forty-two. This is. Wow, this is cool. Forty-two is so stupid. It doesn't make any sense at all. Let's write. For, let's write forty-two in my book. And he writes forty-two. No, and so and the Holy Spirit is smiling and he say, "Well, Douglas, if you knew about something about numerology, you would know that forty-two really is the sense of life. But you don't know, so I'm just make a bit fool out of you because you're trying to make a fool out of me. So I also make a bit fool. Hey, God, he's funny. He has funny." He, he does have that. No, you see, God is also someone to fear. But he, I think God loves jokes, and if we, he's not mad if we make jokes about him. Maybe at some point he can get mad. No, if you constantly make jokes about him, he gets mad. But one joke, God doesn't get mad, and he also makes a joke about you. No, and that's the joke God made because. And Douglas Adams, he was making a joke out of God, so God also made a, made a joke out of him. And he said, "Well, let's make a joke and let's write 42 because 42 really is the sense of life." But I'm going to make the joke like this, so you guys, you you don't even know I'm making a joke out of you. And that's like God is so cool. And you see, if you read that book, what happens in the next in the next book of that story? You no, know, uh, they they make the second computer. And then the Earth is actually that computer, and Arthur Dent is the, the only survival survival people, a guy who survived this Earth. And though these these people, they ask Arthur Dent, so no, what? Yeah, I think Arthur Dent was his name, and they ask him, so what's the right question to this answer for the two? Let's drop the music, sorry. And so they ask, what's the right question? And and Arthur Dent he quotes this song of Bob Dylan, no? He quotes this song. Well, I, I, God, 
is just a genius. He, he's so cool. He's, he's, he has such a humor. He's just a genius. He quotes the song of Bob Dylan. How many roads must a man walk down before you can call him a man? Yes, and how many roads must a man walk down? Before, therefore, everybody, how many cannonballs will fly? Before, they will for everybody. Hey, folks, this song, it's a deep, deep, deep spiritual song. It's the longing that's in all of our hearts. How many cannonballs must fly before, therefore, everybody? This is a deep, deep, deep question, and it's the longing of any heart on this planet. How many cannonballs, how much do I need to suffer until this all ends, until I arrive home? That's the longing of our, all our hearts. We are longing for this ultimate love, for this termination of this suffering here. That's what we all long for, for this being unconditionally loved and accepted and arrive in this cloud of total love finally after we live this life here on this planet. That's what we all long for. And so this song is about it and, and it's, it's talking about the kingdom that is ahead, that is coming. There's a kingdom coming, people. You see signs it has something prophetic. And the prophecy, what is the prophecy of science? The prophecy of science is doom. The prophecy of science is, it says like, well, this planet, it exists for now, I don't know how many trillion years, no, and then the earth is going to collapse, and maybe the sun is going to lose its energy, and then uh, the sun is going to stop shining, and, and uh, this solar system is going to grow cold, and... And so there's no life anymore on earth and then we don't know in trillions or billions or how many billions of years maybe the universe is going to collapse again and there's a new big bang and there will be again a big bang and everything is going to start in you. That's a prophecy of science. So the prophecy of science is there's no purpose, everything is coincidence and we're all going to die and that's it. We, we, we are dust and we, we ever will be dust and we also go back to dust. And so there's no purpose, everything is coincidence. My life has no purpose, because I'm a coincidence, so my life has no purpose. Love has no purpose. We are all just machines, molecular machines, very complex machines, but we are machines. But our life is a coincidence, it has no purpose. And we just live for fun, but fun also has no purpose, it's also just coincidence. And so it, it doesn't make any difference if you shoot yourself today, or you continue to live for the 80 years. And suffering, we cannot explain it, why it's here, it's something terrible, it's, it also doesn't make sense. Suffering is coincidence, so if you're happy or if you suffer, it doesn't make any difference, because it's coincidence. It, suffering makes no sense, and being happy makes no sense, loving a woman makes no sense. Having kids makes no sense, it's useless. It's useless having kids, it's useless loving a, a woman because it's coincidence, it doesn't make sense because you're a machine. And that's a prophecy of science. And it's something so stupid, but people believe it. The whole world believes this stupid stuff. It's some, some of the most stupid claims, some of the most stupid dogmas, and people believe it. They believe that they're coincidence and they're useless and they're, they have no purpose. And they do all these things, they love a woman, they have kids, but they claim it's, it's something useless. And that's prophecy of science. And you see, uh, there's another prophecy. And the, the other prophecy, it says, all is going to be good. There's only going to be love, there's only going to be happiness, there's only going to be joy. And the evil, it is here now, but not forever. It's not here forever. The world, it's not going to be destroyed, and it's not an eternal cycle of evil and good, and then evil and good, and then evil and then good, and then again evil, and then again suffering, and then again be happy, and then again suffering, and then again happy, and then again suffering. You see, eternal life, it doesn't make sense if there is evil. As long as there is evil, eternal life is a torture. 
Because Adam, he lived 900 years in this planet, and it was torture. He had to live 900 years in this planet. Hey folks, I don't want to live 900 years on this planet. This is torture. He had to work in the acre, he had his sweat, he had he had the, the thorns and the thistles in the acre. Imagine this Adam living 900 years in this in this in this garbage world. This is torture, nothing else. Eternal life in this world is torture. Imagine you grow old, you get all this pain in your bones, like for 10, 20 years, every day you, you're full of pain. And the Buddhists, they say you come back another time. And hey folks, imagine a thousand times you get born, you be a child again, you, you burn your hand on the in the kitchen again. A thousand times this rubbish! A thousand times going to the retirement home, like for ten years you, you get Alzheimer, you have all this pain, and the Buddhists say you, you get this thousand times again. Hey man, this God would be no one else than the devil if he had created world like this. If he had created the world like this, so we have go, to go through this all this garbage world and all this pain and all these wars and suffering and being mean to one another and curse one another and this a thousand times again. Hey, sorry man, if this were God, it would, would be no one else than the devil personally because this world, it's the paradise of the devil. So if we would have to stay in this world forever, God would be no one else than the devil because this world is the par is the paradise of the devil because evil is here. It's it also good is here. So it is kind of a paradise, but the because all these terrible things are here, it is the paradise of the devil. Oh, that's the imagination of the devil, how the devil imagines paradise. Like everybody wants to be the king on the earth, everybody wants to be God himself, everybody wants to rule the world, to conquer the world, that's our deepest inner longing, to rule the world, to rule about all our friends, to rule above all our are about, about our husband, about, about our spouse, to rule. That's the deepest evil longing in our heart, to rule above the world. We have been blessed with, with an anointing from God. He said, uh, um, get, get more people and, and, and submit the world to you. So this is put in our heart, to submit the world, but because evil came into our heart, we want to be like God and we want to rule over the world to to be evil to the world. That's our deepest intention, to be evil. That's the reason why we want to rule the world. And first God put this desire to rule the world into our hearts, but in order to bless the world, not to be evil to the world, but to bless it. But our heart turned corrupted, so now we don't want to rule above the world anymore to bless the world, but to submit it to our ego. And so everybody should worship us. And you see this with the politicians. They want to be worshipped. And for this purpose they submit the world. But also, because also the good is also in their hearts. So they're not that corrupted like Satan. So they're not just trying to get the worship. They also do good stuff. Because also the good is still in their heart. But if it were Satan who were ruling there. He only tried to be worshipped. And this is also in our hearts. We also try. We also have this longing to be like God and to be worshipped. And so, let's go back to the 42. Okay, this 42, uh, the joke is, it is, it really is the sense of why and why. If we go back to that song, it says, how many roads must a man walk down? And now, this, the answer to why 42 is, is really, is really uh, the answer to, uh, to the sense of life. It's, it's something very theoretically. Um, the, the things I told you up to now, it's not so much theory, it's practical, it's, it's, it's things I really do live in my life. It's, it's things I, I did do in my life. I, I have a ministry here in Nicaragua, I'm a missionary. I live with alcoholics and try to get them free from alcohols. And I'm, I'm not married, so that's the only thing I strive for. I don't have kids, like physical kids, but I do have spiritual kids. And I do live for those kids, nothing more and nothing less. I live for my kids, but for my spiritual kids, and my spiritual kids are those alcoholics and I try to help them to get free of that alcohol and to, to really have a life of purpose and to, to get out of that life without purpose. That's what I live for 
And so the things I told before, they are practical. But because of this discussion about the 42, we have to do some theory now. And the smart guys, you, uh, the smart guys of you, they will, they will, they will uh, stop this now and they will listen to some other video. And the guys, who they, uh, you of the guys of you who are interested in theory, okay, we can make the theory. Also, we can do spiritual observation too. You can also do observation with spirit, with spiritual things. And so let's do it and let's discuss why 42 really is the sense of life. It's theory that it's nothing practical. It's knowledge. But knowledge, it's only useful if you put it into practice. Otherwise, it's theory, and if it remains theory, it has no power, it has no consequences for your life. So knowledge is something beautiful, but uh, practice is more beautiful, and wisdom is more beautiful. And But we're going to study this knowledge now. So 42, uh, if you go into no numerology and you know about numerology, you, you can get to the answer that 42 really is the sense of life, in, in, by means of numerology, but so let's let's study this. Okay, if we go to Mark ten, in Mark ten we see no, not I told you about Mark ten. It's not in Mark ten. It's I think in the first gospel of the Bible. There's there's a, a genealogy of Jesus. Let's go to that first to that genealogy of Jesus. If you look there, and there are actually two genealogies of Jesus, and they're a bit different. But we, we mainly now we look we just looked at, at the first. The, the other genealogy is different, but let's look at the first. And so this first, if you count the people, the forefathers of Jesus since Adam, it's exactly forty two forefathers. So Jesus he has exactly forty two forefathers from Adam to Jesus. And yeah, well this number forty two, it's just there. It says fourteen generations since Adam to Abraham. 14 generations from Abraham to to David and 14 generations from David to to uh, to Jesus. And so the number 42 is there but the Bible doesn't say anything about it. But if you want to know why 42 and to examine the Bible in uh, about the meanings of the numbers you you need numerology and what is numerology? You see the, the Bible has a long tradition, and there are actually two traditions in the Bible. There's the Jewish tradition, and there's the Christian tradition. And of course, the Christian tradition, it was mainly interested in morals. The Christian tradition did study the Bible to, to learn about morals, to learn about living a life that's pleasing God. So that was the main intention of the Christian tradition. And the Jewish tradition, it's an older tradition, it's a tradition with less revelation about who God is, that he's a father who loves his kids. The Jews, they didn't have this revelation. And to the Jews, a lot, God was like a strange being that's up in heaven, and life was hard, and they tried to understand life and to live their life, and they also wanted to understand the secrets of God. God was way more a mystery to them and so it's a way more mysterious approach to God and to, it's way more about discovering the mysteries of wisdom and of God. That's way more the intention of the Jewish tradition is way more discovering mysteries like wisdom or mysteries of God. And so and that's also what numerology so because the Jewish they have a way deeper knowledge than the Christians just also all because of the language because only just even only because of the language they have a deeper knowledge because the Jewish language the Hebrew language it's it's a special language and a lot of wisdom is even put into that language and uh, the Jews uh, the Hebrew language, the scripture of the Hebrew language, they don't have the Arabic letters like we Europeans have, like the Western world has. Uh, right in the Jewish language, the letters are also numbers, and so that means every word is also a number, and any letter has a numerical value, and also every word has a numerical value, and because numbers are also words, every number also has an attribute and every word also has a number and because the word has a number and the numbers have attributes because they are also uh, mean words you can also uh, make 
connections between words. Because words that have the same number, they are connected, so they have similar attributes, they have similar meanings. And so you can learn, even through the language, you can learn so many things. Even like names of God, they have numbers, and even those numbers reveal something about those names. And so that's Jewish tradition. And most of the Christians, they have no idea about the secrets of the Jewish tradition. And in order to change your heart to be a holy person, you don't need to know all this Jewish tradition. It's not, as I said to you, knowledge is theory, it doesn't change your heart. So in order to, to get a holy person, you need to practice love, you need to serve the poor, you need to serve people, and that's how you get a holy person. And knowledge is something different. Through knowledge, you can learn how what you need to do in order to get a holy person, but it still remains to do the things. But the knowledge is also a good thing because you can learn what do I need to do to get from A to B and to get a holy person. So knowledge is also something valuable. But knowledge without the, without the flesh, it's, it's, it's crap, it's, it's, it's garbage. So knowledge without... Um, doing the things you know is garbage. And so, but it's, it's something interesting and you can also learn from knowledge. And so, uh, let's go into that numerology. And now 42, um, we all know 42, it's, it's, uh, if you take the prime numbers from 42, it's 6 times 7, no? And numerology, it deals a lot with prime factors and stuff like this. So it's 6 times 7. And so we see that in, in 42 there is the 6 and there is the 7. No? And if you know about the 6, probably all of you know this number 666. Now it's, it's some of the most famous numbers of numerology, 666, and I'm going to explain, explain shortly why, what is the secret of that number 666 in numerology. And so 666, it has a long history, no? It's uh, it comes from Babylon. This number, it's actually uh, it comes from the number six. And the number six, what is the number six? I have to first explain the number six. So the number six, if you look in the Bible, uh, in the first chapter in Genesis, on the sixth day was the day when Adam sinned, when when evil entered the world. The the sixth day was the day when evil did enter the world through this snake that was lying to evil, no? So, and um, if you, you can even look at the letters, at, uh, at the Arabic letters we have today, and all those letters, they also have a spiritual meaning. They're spiritual, they're not only number symbols, but they're also spiritual symbols. And if you, if you examine those, those letters, you can get at the meaning of those letters. So if you look at the number six, it looks like this. No, this is a six. I, I do it, I do it the wrong way because I'm in front of the camera. But if you imagine a six, if you want, what's the spiritual meaning of that letter? If you look at that letter, this is all numerology, of course. And if you look at that letter, if you, you see it has an upper part and a lower part. And if you, if you say like, like the lower part is our world, and the upper part is, it's, 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 uh, it's the other world, it's the spiritual world, it's, it's, it's heaven, no? And so we can say, the six below is a circle, um, above it's like some, it's not a circle, it's, it's, it's just some, I don't know the English word, it's, it's some part of a circle, no? And so below in our world is a circle, it's, it's complete, it's, 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 it's something complete, it's something whole. And in heaven, in, 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 in the spiritual world, it's, it's, yeah, it's not whole, it's, it's not there, it's not really complete, it's just, it, it's, it's, it's there in, a, in an approach, no? And so, what that means is, if, if six is evil or lie, uh, it means evil or the lie, then in our world, it means our world is complete in the lie. And in heaven, there is no lie, there is, and there is no evil, there is, yeah, there is some something. It's, it's there some in some approach, but it, it's not really there. It's and in our life, there is no truth. Everything we know, every every revelation we get, every knowledge we have, it's only an approximation to the truth. It's never the whole truth. It's only an approximation. It's still a lie. Even the the thing uh, the things I believe who I am I don't know even who I am 
I can feel myself, I do feel my heart, I live inside of my heart, I feel my heart, I feel my spirit, I, feel, I, I notice my thoughts, I hear my words, but I don't know who I am. I think I'm quite like this, I'm quite like that, I'm quite like this, I'm kind of this, I'm kind of nice, I'm kind of uh, nice to people, I'm, I kind of help alcoholics, I kind of love people, sometimes I kind of hate people, that's all I know about myself, but it's not the truth, it's not the truth who I am. I don't know who I am, even though I, I am who I am, and I am myself, but I even don't know who I am. And I, I only know an approximation of who I am, even though I am the one I am, no? I even don't know who is this, who I am. And so, I do, we live in a world that is captured in lie. We never can get really through to the truth, because the truth is not part of this world, it's part of the other world, of, of the invisible world. There, there is something called truth, but in our world, any truth we know is just an approximation to the truth. And so, that's the meaning of the six, is, is the lie and, and the evil, no? And also, if we come to this number 666, everyone knows it's evil, but why is, is what is the meaning of 666? It comes from, from Babylon, from this all, the first, the first, uh, Babylon was the first worldly kingdom, the first nation that was, at, at that time there was only that nation, and so it's the first world political system. Babylon was the first political world system, the first political government. And so the Babylonians, first there was Noah, the, so the people all this day descended the ark of Noah, and all those, Noah he was a, a God-fearing person, he worshipped God, he honored God, he, know about, he knew about the truth, he was building the ark like hundred years, he was talking to God and building the ark, so he, he knew God quite a lot. And some of the sons of Noah, like, like uh, I don't know, one of the sons was Cush, and the son of Cush, one of the sons, he was Nimrod. And Nimrod, he was the guy he wanted to be a king. He was very corrupted, he departed from God, and he had a very corrupted heart. And he wanted to be a king, he wanted to rule over others, and so he, he, he decided to become a king, and he was the first king after Noah. And so he, he, the people there, they made an invention, they invented how to construct uh, bricks out of, out of, out of, uh, out of, um, out of, uh, oh my god, out of earth, no? And they, they noticed they can burn the earth and make bricks out of it. And so because of this invention, the people got proud, got proud, and they got so proud, they said, hey, we invented something, we can be gods. Because that's what happens when, when humans, we are called, that's our destiny to invent things, to use our brain, because that's our dignity, that's destiny of mankind, because we ate from the tree of wisdom about good and evil, so we ate from the tree of wisdom, so we are, we are called to, to grow in wisdom, we are called to, 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 to do science, that's a calling of mankind, so we did science, but what happens when we invent something in science, we, we, we think we are God, that's what happens to our hearts, we immediately we get proud and we think we are like God through our wisdom, through our in, uh, inventions, and that's what happened there. They invented how to make bricks, and so they they thought they're gods, and that's what happened to this Nimrod guy. He thought he's a god, and he married his own mother, that was Semiramis, and he called her the queen of the heavens, and they started to build that tower of Babel, you know, the tower of Babylon, and and because they thought they're gods. And so they they wanted to be God, and that's so. So we see this, and and those Babylonians, they they also made this calendar, or I think no, I think it was Noah who made this calendar with the twelve months, and also in this twelve, of course, there's the six in this twelve, and so those those pagan people they started uh, uh, saying those mo months they are gods. So they, they, they said we, they are uh, 36, they, 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 they are 360 days in a year, and they said there are 36 gods who rule over 
over the earth, and they because they 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 also made the star images. I think they come from Noah. Noah he 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 uh, divided uh, have the stars in the, those star signs. I think the, this knowledge about the star signs it comes from Noah, or maybe from before Noah. And Noah he knew about those things, and so he they divided the, the stars in, in those twelve star signs. And so, because of the year that has 360 days, they divided it in 36 parts. And so they said there are 36 gods. And they attributed the gods to stars. And so they sum up the, the gods, like one, if you sum up 1 to 36, you get 666. And they said this, the, the most high god, it's, I think it was, in Babylon, it was Baal. I don't, I don't remember. And he's, they said, if this is the 666, this this guy, he's the most high god, because one to 36, it sums up to 666. That's where this number com comes from. And so, if you sum up one to 36, you get 666. And if you look at this from numerology, 36 is six times six. And the number you get, if you sum up this, is 666. So we see it's always in the 6. It always remains in the 6. So 6 is, is evil, is lie, you have seen. So if you if you times 6 times 6, you get 36. If you sum this up, you get 666. So, so there's always the 6 in that number. It, it never gets above the 6. It never gets above egoism. It never gets above evil. It, it always remains in the egoism, in the selfishness, in the in the blasphemy, it, it never goes above the six. And that's our carnal nature, the, the nature of our carnal heart, if God is not inside of it, we, if we don't allow God to put his love in our heart, that's our carnal nature, that's the nature of the I. The I is the I. I, the part of me that is the I, my ego, it's my I. It's my. It's my ego. It's. It's. And and the I. It only thinks about the I. No. The me. The the part of me that is I. That is my ego. It only thinks about me. About I. About my ego. That's the only thing it cares about. It thinks about. And everything that is above this. Everything that has mercy. Everything that loves someone. Everything that really does care for someone else. It's inside of me, but it has been given to me. It's actually not my spirit. This is not my spirit. It's the spirit of love. It's some other spirit that lives inside of me, but it's not my spirit. My spirit, or my old nature, it only cares about I. It only cares about my ego. And only the love I do live and I practice, it's another spirit. It's not really me. It's something that has been given to me because only God is love. All the love that's in this world is Him. All the happiness, all the good things, it has been created by Him. It's actually Him Himself who comes to live inside of me, who, who blesses me with His presence. That's the good things in my life. It's He's good, and everything that's good is He. Everything, every love in a tree, in, a, in an animal, in, in a stone, every love... It's God in that stone. It's God in that tree. And that's what a lot of esoterics, they, they embrace trees, no? And that's what they feel like. They feel that the love is everywhere. And why is the love everywhere? It's because this being, this this higher being, this however you want to name it, like God, or He is in that tree. And that's what we feel. This, this love in that tree is Him. And also the love inside of us, it's, it's Him. It's that being that is love, no? And so we see that the 666, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's always staying in evil, never, to never change, to never, to never grow in love. That is 666, to, to always want to stay in that selfishness. That is 666. And so uh, we all know Jesus, no? Jesus, uh, we all know the story of Jesus and Jesus, he says he's the son of God and he did a lot of love. We all know this. He, he healed the lame. He healed a lot of sick people. He embraced the leopards and he, he was an, a total example of living love. And if you go to numerology, uh, if you write the name of Jesus Christ in Greek, and even the name of Jesus, it's, it's not really a translation. His true name in Hebrew or in Aramaic is Yeshua. That's his true name. 
But in Greek, his name is Jesus. And even the name Jesus in Greek, it's, it's a false translation because his true name is Yeshua. And the name Yeshua has to do with, with the name of his father, Yahweh. It's, it's a, a, it says, Yahweh saves. That's the name of Jesus. Yahweh saves. That's the meaning of Yeshua. And so because Jesus came here to save, you know, he, he was the good shepherd who ran after all these stupid sheep that go astray and, and seek their pleasure and seek their, their egoism and seek the, the like, like the Zacchaeus guy, he was, he was, uh, he was, uh, he was, uh, going after a huge pun bunch of money and he was only to collecting tax and being mean to people and betray people with his money. He was a rich lad and Jesus came to him and said, I have, today I have to come to your place and they were celebrating and party in the house and this was so touching the heart of Zacchaeus that this this pincher this this uh, greedy guy he changed changed into a saint oh and that was the only purpose Jesus was after with his life and so yeah and so the, the Greek name it means Jesus and Jesus it's it's a it's a wrong translation it means also this G it's it's from Yahweh of course but Zeus it, it means Zeus. It, it means son of Zeus because Zeus was the most high god of the Greeks. So it's it's a Greek translation of the nom, name Yeshua, but it's not even a translation. It's it's a Greek wrong form of son of God. No? And but if you write that name in Greek, Jesus Christ. If you write that in Greek, also the Greeks they have the same as in Hebrew. They also also their letters are numbers. Also in this language. Because it's an old language, also in their la uh, scripture, the the letters are numbers. And if you count those numbers, Jesus Christ, the numbers of those letters, you get the number 888. And this is interesting. So 888, it's the number of Jesus. And But in Hebrew, uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, it gives a different number. But in Greek, it gives 888. And... Uh, so, and you also encounter this number 888 in, in connection with Jesus in other places in scripture. And so 888 is the number of Jesus. And if also you look at the letter of 8, what is the meaning of 8? Eight? 8 is the miracle and also salvation. And also Jesus, of course. Because you have a circle above... And a circle below, it means it's complete in heaven and it's complete in earth. And this is something that doesn't exist. Something that is perfect in heaven cannot be perfect in earth. And something that's perfect on earth, it's, it's an abomination in heaven. And so this is a miracle. It's, it's a miracle, something on earth that, that has evil to it. And it's even perfect in heaven. This is a miracle, something that doesn't exist. And it's salvation. It's what happens in, sal in salvation. Like we are saved as sinners, we still are accepted in heaven. Even though we are sinners, we do... We are not always sinners, but sometimes we are, and we, we do evil things, we also do good things, but we are not perfect. We, we, we have guilt with us. And still, that we have, still, even though we have killed, we, we are made perfect in heaven. We are accepted, we are loved, unconditional, even though we don't deserve this. And we are loved in heaven, and we are, we are also perfect in heaven. And how does this work? It only works through the through that Jesus has been perfect. Jesus always loved. He never was evil. And he sacrificed his life. And through this sacrifice, through this person who was always loved, who never was mean, who never was evil, who never was selfish. And he gave his blood, he gave his soul to cover our soul with his love, with his with his mercy, with his with his being faithful, with his be never being evil, with his never hating, with his never never doing something mean to someone. And with his blood he covered our our evil nature. And through this blood we are made perfect in the sight of heaven. And that's the eight. It is perfect on earth through this blood. With, 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 by, covered, by being covered through this blood, we walk around in this world as sinners, but in God's eyes we are perfect. Because we are covered with this perfect soul, with this perfect blood that never did anything evil. And when God looks at us, he sees this Jesus guy who never did evil. Because he sees the blood on us of this Jesus. He sees the soul of Jesus in us. And so he sees a perfect circle when he looks at us in, um, in this earth. 
And also in heaven, of course, it's perfect. And that's the eight. It's perfect in heaven and it's perfect on earth. And that's what salvation is. And so that's the number of Jesus. Perfect in heaven and perfect in a broken, in a fallen world. That's the number of Jesus. And so we see 888 is the number of Jesus and 8 is means salvation. And also the 9, if you look at the 9, it's a circle in heaven. And it's like the 6 was only a, a, a part of the circle in, in heaven. The 9 is the opposite, it's, it's part of a circle in earth. So, so the 9, the meaning of the 9 is true. Because in, pe in heaven it's, it's perfect, truth is perfect in heaven. In heaven there is truth, you no, know? and there's no lie in heaven. And on earth, truth, it doesn't exist. It's something that doesn't really exist. And also, if you look at the nine, if you, if you look at the, the numbers that come from nine, like two times nine, it's 18, three times nine, it's 27. If you take the sum of those numbers, like one, one and eight, 18, one and eight, it's nine, two and seven, it's, it's nine. If you, if you go farther, like, uh, three times nine, it's, it's 36, and the sum of those letters is also 9, so so it's always 9, The sum it always stays in the 9, that means the 9 always stays in the 9, that means the truth always remains the truth, no? And so, if if you look now at the 7, we come back now to the 7, because we, we said before, 42 is 6 times 7. So we come back to the 7, what is the meaning of the 7 in the in those 6 times 7. So we have seen 6 is, 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 is evil, it's, it's our old nature, it's our egoism, it's our old life. We live in selfishness and in egoism. So the 6 is our old life, our evil nature. And so what is the 7? We see now the 7 is the Shabbat. In, in, in on the 7th day there was the Shabbat. There was God who did rest from creation of the world. He said this, this day should be a day of rest. I'm going to rest on this day and I want people to be happy on this day and to rest from their work, to, to have a nice pleasure, day of pleasure, and to just rest. And so we see the seven is the Shabbat. And we also see this in the letter of seven, like seven is a, is a, is a how do you say in English, it's a trait, it's a trait in above, and below it's, it's an advancement, it comes from the left, it advances upwards, to the right, to the end of time, from the beginning of time, it advances upwards to the right, to the end of time, in our world. So we see, in our world, it's an increase. So that means, in our world, peace should increase, and in heaven, it's already there. It's always been there, and it always will be there. There's always peace in heaven. Pe heaven is the place where there's peace. And so, in heaven it's just a trait that remains and ever, forever has been there and forever will be there. So, the seven is the Shabbat, the, the, the rest. And, um, and why it, it's an increasement on earth? You could say, well, peace doesn't increase on earth, it always gets worse. And of course, yes, on, on earth, it, peace doesn't increase. It, it gets worse, and there's always more war, and more war, and more terrible wars, and more terrible wars. But, in the life of a Christian, the peace does increase. So, the, the letter is not for the world, it's not meant for the world. This is meant for, for your spiritual life. In your spiritual life, the peace does increase. If you live without God, of course your peace does not increase. That's, that's of course, of course it does not. And so, but uh, this letter is not talking the story of, of people without God. It's about talking about the story of people that love God. Because this letter has been made for people who love God. It has been made for the, the people of God. It has not been made for people who want to live without God. Because this letter has been made by God. And so, we see an increase in peace. And uh, so, and the seven also has another meaning. If we look at the first sentence of the Bible, the first sentence of the Bible, it says, In the beginning God created heaven and earth. The heavens and earth. And also the Hebrew folks, I talked about Hebrew tradition, about numerology, and as they have, every word has numbers, and all the rabbis, and all this, uh, all those uh, sacerdotes, all, all those teachers of the scripture, they have uh, a lot of knowledge about those numbers, and about those words, and they teach about this stuff a lot. 
And so they, they look at the sentence and they examine the numbers. And those rabbis, they have a lot of knowledge in things like this. And, and so they, if you examine the, this sentence from numerology, in the beginning there was heavens and earth, uh, there was, there was, in the beginnings, God created heavens and earth. So if you look at the sentence in numerology, if you take the three words, God, heaven and earth, they have, all those words have numbers in Hebrew, and you can count the numbers. And so if you take the, the words God and heaven in Hebrew, and sum up the numbers, you get the number 888. So God and heaven in Hebrew, it get, you get the number 888, and we have seen it's the number of Jesus. So we see Jesus, he's the God of heaven, of eternity, of paradise, he's the God of paradise. And we see this from the number 888. If you take the words God and heaven in Hebrew, we get the number 888. And now, if we take the words God and earth in Hebrew, we get the number 666. Because Satan, he is the God of this earth. But, of course, he's not only Satan is the God of this earth, also Jesus and God, they, they also are gods of this world. Because if only Satan were God of this world, this would be hell, no? But... But uh, God also rules over this world. But God, uh, Satan, he, he rules over this world. And why he does rule over this world? Well, because the authority over this world, it has been given to us humans. We are meant to rule over this world. And because Adam, he gave authority to Satan. He, he did obey Satan and he ate from this, from this apple. And by this, he gave authority to Satan. So... As, as soon as we do evil things, we give authority to evil because the authority has been given to us. And because the authority has been given to us, when we do evil, we pass on the authority to Satan. And that's why Satan, he kind of is also the god of this world. Because evil is in this world, and every time we do evil, we pass on authority to evil. And so we see 666, it's, if you take the Hebrew words God and earth, you get to the 666. And now it's interesting, if you take the words God and earth and heaven, if you take those three words, the number you get is 777. So we see, who's the God of earth and heaven? That's God the Father. If Jesus is God of heaven, if he's the God, the king of the coming age, then God, he is God who created he heaven and the earth. He's the God who created everything, every history, every everything in the past, everything in the future. The future, uh, the future, um, uh, the future uh, world, the future, the coming kingdom, the coming uh, cycle of, of the world, and also the past, like this, this this cycle of the world we live in, like this this world where there is pain, where there is suffering, where the evil is, he created also this. So he's the creator of everything, and so he's God of heaven and earth. And so his number is 777. The number of the Father is 777. And so we see the seven is also the Father. Because eight is, the, is Jesus and the seven is also the Father. So we see the seven, it's, it's a number for God himself. It's completeness, it's the Shabbat, but it's also God. And so what does this mean, six times seven? So we see that 36, there's the six times six, it's always evil, it's the number of the devil. And what is the six times seven? It's the evil and it's God in the same number. So the, the 42, it's, it's the number where the six and the seven meets. It's the number where there's evil and there's also God and there's the good. So it's, it's kind of us. It's kind of us humans. We are in between Satan and between God. No, we, we are the six and the seven. In, in, there's the evil in us and there's also God in us and this is kind of us and so the 42 it, it's man, it, it's us but it's, it's not the 36 it's not our old life 
where we say, well, I want to be God, I want to rule over my life, I want to be an egoist, I want to be selfish, I want to have sex with that woman, because I want to. That's not the 42, that is the 36. That is the 36 that never wants to change, that wants to be its own God, and to, to live according to its desires, and not according to its destiny. You see, freedom is not freedom to live your desires. Freedom is to live your destiny, to live and obey your destiny. That is freedom. That is true freedom is to live your destiny, to live your calling, to live your purpose. That is freedom, to be able to live that. Freedom to live it, that is freedom. And it means to obey your destiny, because if you don't obey your destiny, you're not free anymore to live your destiny. If you go another way and go to, and work in a bank and go only go after money, you're not free anymore to live your destiny. And so, um, and so, we see the six and the seven. It's it's uh, it's it's where God and our carnal nature, our old nature, meets. And so, why is it the sense of life? It's it's um, it's that point in your life where you meet God. You see, it's it's the point in your life when God enters your life. When you get to know God, it's that moment in your life when you get to know the love of your Heavenly Father. That, that moment is the 42. The 42 is that moment in your life when the 7 enters the 6, when God reveals Himself to you, when you realize, this guy, he, he's real. It's not a fairy tale, he's real, he's there, and he is hearing you. That, this moment is the 42. This moment when you realize God is real and when He enters your heart, when you start feeling His love, not the love of a woman or a man, but the love of a, of a, of a higher being. When you start feeling this love, the first time in your life you feel this love, that is the 42, when this 7 enters your life in the 6. That is the 42. The 42 means to get to know God or Jesus and it's it's the purpose of life because that's what this life is about. Why we are on this planet, why we are not in paradise, why there is not only paradise, why not only love and only paradise and everything is okay, everything is good. Why we have been cast out of paradise, why we need to be in this world where there is war and there is suffering and there is uh, there's retirement home, there's growing old, there's kids that don't obey and I need to go to work and there's sweat on my head because I have to work, there's, I get mad and why, why is all this here? Why are you not in paradise? And why is this so? And why is there a purpose to it? And the purpose to it is we have a free will, we can decide about our lives. We have been given this life as a present but we have a free will also. We can decide to love, we can decide to hate. With this free will, we are called to freedom and we also need to be free. We need to have our, our free will is something holy, it's something sacred. Our free will is something very sacred and God, He, he doesn't touch it by no means. God, He doesn't touch our free will by no means. We are completely free to decide about, about our lives. We have been given this life, but what we do with this life, it's something totally, we are totally free. We are totally free to love with our lives, and we are totally free to hate with our lives. We have, we have been made for freedom, and so we can decide freely if we want to hate, or if we want to love. That's something that is, we are totally free to do. And because we are totally free, we need to make a choice. We have been put in this world to make a choice. To make a choice if we want to love or if we want to hate. We have been put in this world where there is hate and there is love, so we can choose, I want to be a person that loves. I want to be a person, or we can make a choice, I want to be a person that is an egoist, that lives for, I want to be a king in this world, I want to hate people, I want to people serving me. And I don't want to serve people, I want people to serve me, and I want to hate them, and I want to use them, and I want to live only for myself. And that we can also do this with our life that has been given to us. And it's a choice, 
And because every one of us needs to make this choice, do I want to live for love, for love, to love, or do I want to live for to hate? Do I want to spend eternity with love? Is that the purpose of my life, to love? And I want to live like this, and that's what I, why I want to live. Or do I want to live for my desires, for my ego, for my hatred, for my perversion, for my, for my selfishness? And I want only life to serve me. I only want life that it loves me, but I'm not gonna love anyone. I want to people to love me, but I'm not gonna to love people. So this is a decision we have to make. And that is why this world exists. That's why evil is in this world, so we can make a choice. So if there's no evil in this world, we cannot make that choice because we don't know what evil is. So we cannot choose be between the two. So because we need to choose between the two, both of them need to be here. So we can choose. And so, uh, if we have made, 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 if we made the choice, if we cho choose, no, I don't want to hate forever. I don't, that's not my right. I don't want to live to hate that. I want to love with my life. That should be the purpose of my life, to love. And if I want that, I need to serve life. I cannot serve my ego and at the same time love. I need to serve love. If I, if I want to live for love, I need to serve love. And if I don't care, if I just want to have my life, I don't need to serve anyone. It's not, I can be my boss. I can be the boss. I can be the king of the world. I don't need to serve anyone. I can be king. But the truth is, I don't realize I do need to serve. Also in this case, I, I do need to serve my ego. I do need to serve the evil inside of me, my desires, my, my advantage, my, my, yes. And, and in order to have advantage, I do need to hate. And so it's about serving, but people who, who don't want to serve love, they think they don't need to serve, but they, they also need to serve, but they need to serve evil. Either you serve good or evil, you need to serve. And only if you serve evil, it looks like you don't need to serve. It looks like you're the king, but you're a slave. And if you serve love, it looks like you're a slave. It looks like you have to serve, but you're a king and you're free. And so, um, so the 42 is, is that moment in your life when you may meet God and you make that choice of serving love with all your life. And so in that moment, when you choose to serve love with all your life, you can go to the other world because you made your choice and that's what this life is about. And as soon as you make the choice, you can go to the next world because you made your choice and you fulfilled the purpose of this, of this cycle of life. You fulfilled the purpose, you made the choice, and as soon as you made the choice, you can encounter and meet and experience the next world. And as soon as you make the choice, I want to live for love with all my life, I want to live for God with all my life. As soon as this happens, God will reveal himself to you. You will meet God, you will feel his love, you will feel God, and he will start talk to you. And you meet him and you get to know him because you made the choice and that's the purpose of this life. So you can advance to the next life. And the next life is not only after you died, we're gonna go there. You can also experience it already in this life when you make the choice. Then you have a right to advance. As, as long as you did not make the choice, you're stuck in your choice, in making the choice. And you have to make the choice, and you cannot advance to the next life, to the next cycle. And as soon as you make the choice, you experience the next life, also in this life, in this cycle. And you meet angels, you meet God, of course not physically, not in this world, but uh, the next life, in this life, we, we experience it mostly, mainly through our fantasy. The, the connection is by meditation, by praying, by fantasy, by imagination that I'm with God and I'm walking around with Jesus. You just imagine those things first and then your imagination, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger and this imagination starts talking to you. You didn't have the intention that this imagination is talking to you. It just starts talking without you having any intention. 
And that's how we enter the spiritual world. First, it's your imagination. It's you imagining, imagining that this Jesus guy is standing here. And if you practice this a long time, if you, if you get stronger in it, then the Jesus guy he starts talking to you by his own, without you doing anything. Because you entered this world. And then the world starts moving around by itself, without you doing anything. But first, it uses imagination to enter the world. So that's normally, usually how we go there to meditation, to imagination. There are other ways how to go there, like through LSD or through drugs, or also in dreams we go in this world. But drugs is a dangerous way, and it's not the way that has been made by God. It's not the, the way God meant it to be. It's, the, it's a way from the devil to enter that world. Because the drugs, it, you go so intense into that world, and this world is its not only love, there's also evil stuff in this world, and this can be dangerous, because in this world we're kind of safe, we're in a safe place, and as long as you have faith, you can go into that world, and that's what you experience on an LSD trip, as long as you have faith, you experience a lot of God's love on an LSD trip, I never took LSD, I don't know what... I don't speak out of experience, but I talk to a lot of people, and that's my explanation. But as soon as you get into fear, and you go into that world through LSD, and you cannot go back. If in prayer, if you get afraid, you always can go back. But in LSD, you cannot go back, and when you're afraid, you stay there. And this can be dangerous. It can be even so dangerous, you never, never can get back. And you always stay there, and you never get back. You, get, you, you stay a crazy guy. So drugs... You can go there through drugs, but it's a dangerous way, and it's not a way that it was meant to be like it. And also meditation and the spiritual way, it can even be more, far more stronger than drugs. Like, uh, I have a lot of friends that took drugs, and one of those, there was a lady, she was on heroin, and she said, heroin, it's just a bad copy of the Holy Spirit of the devil. You also feel love through heroin, but it's a bad copy. You can feel way more love through God. And of course, normally through prayer, prayer you don't feel that love. And how can you get at the, this love? And it's easy. This love, it has to enter your heart in order, in order to feel it. So a lot of people, they don't believe in God. And from time to time, they do pray. And this, those prayers, they don't change anything. They don't feel God's love. And in order to feel the love, it has to be inside of you so you can feel it. So you need to allow God to enter your heart in order to feel His love. You need to allow God's love entering your heart if you want to feel it. But if you feel it, this is way, way stronger than any drug you ever could take. If you once feel this love from God, it's way stronger. You cannot experience this with drugs. It's impossible. You cannot experience feelings that strong through drugs. It's, it's, it's in vain. You, drugs like this, they will never be invented. And so, we see the 42 is actually the, the point when God enters your life. That's the 42. And we also see it in the story of Jesus with this genealogy. It's the moment when the Messiah comes into the world. That's when the salvation comes into the world. That's the 42. And that's the purpose of life. To bring this salvation into this world. Not only for Jesus, but also for us. It's our purpose to bring healing, to bring comfort, to bring salvation to the broken hearted. And to bring salvation with our broken hearts to other broken hearts. That's our purpose. Our purpose is not to run after money. It's to bring healing to a broken world. It was the calling and the purpose of Jesus, and it's also our calling and our purpose. And that is the 42. And that's the sense of love. Okay, folks, I hope you had a lot of fun with this, with this presentation. And I hope you do now know that it's not only a joke about the 32, it is the truth. But it's because God is a funny guy, he loves to make jokes, and so he made this joke even in the book of Douglas Adams. He, he makes a lot of jokes like this. But if we don't go for the secrets, if we don't go for the deeper things, we never find out. Because God, he's a hidden God, he's a secret God. If he makes jokes, they're hidden. You need to uncover them 
to get at the true jokes of God. No, it's, it's God, he's, he wants to, us to fi find out who he is. He wants us to seek him, to, to find out the secrets, to, to go after the secret. That's our nature, our nature, our nature. We want to find out. We are like small child, we want to find out. And God, he's, he's also like, he's like the father. He wants us to play and find out the secrets he has to, he has put in nature, he has put in his creation. He put a lot of secrets in there. And our destiny as humans, we are curious. We want, we want to find out about this creation. We have been put in this creation, and we try to find out what God did put there. And he's, he's like a father. He put a lot of stuff there, and he wants to find his, ch his children. He wants them to find out, to discover. That's our human nature. And so we need to go for the secrets, not only for the scientific secrets, but also for the spiritual secrets. That's our destiny. That's our calling. Okay, thanks for listening folks and I hope you enjoyed this, this uh, presentation and I hope you, uh, yeah, let's, let's finish with a prayer because you see I gave now a lot of theory, it's all theory and as I said, knowledge, you need to practice knowledge and so if I'm speaking here about love, about, about Jesus, about God, it's all theory for you. For me it's practice, I meet Jesus every day, I talk to him, I, I love him, I, I hug him, but it needs to be something you live. So. I want to do now some experiment because you see a lot of atheists they ask for proof they say I, I need a proof otherwise I don't believe no and you folks you claim to be scientific and you 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 you, uh, you insist on a proof and you don't even know what a proof is no a lot of people who deny God they say you cannot prove it it's 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 just a dogma and they say God doesn't exist and they don't realize they counter a dogma with another dogma. And this is not, it is, this has nothing to do with the proof. And a dogma, of course, it's also not a proof. And Christianity, it doesn't know any dogmas. A dogma is something foreign to Christianity, even though the Catholic Church, it has a lot of dogmas, but the Catholic Church is not a Christian church. It's a church of Satan. And this church has a lot of dogmas, but dogma is something foreign to Christianity. And what is the contrary of a dogma? A dogma is just some, some statement you have to believe. And it's, it's the same in, sci in science, you call this a thesis. It's someone, he has an idea and he, he, he makes some calculation, he puts some formulas, and the formulas, they make sense. And so he, he, he puts this in the air and he says, this is the thesis. It could be the truth, it could also be not the truth. So we need a proof, this, is, this thesis is actually true. So we need a proof this dogma is actually true in, in, in a spiritual sense. And so what is a proof in science? In science, a proof, you call it an experiment. In science, in order to get a proof, you make an experiment. And it needs to be an experiment you can always repeat, and it always turns out the same. So if you make an experiment and you repeat it, you repeat it, and it always turns out with the same, with the same, uh, with the same numbers and with the same result, you, this is kind of a proof. It's not, it's not a, a yeah, you, even though it's a proof, you still cannot be sure it's really like this, no? because with time you can make other theses and they change your thesis you did before and there are other experiments they will contradict again. And so the truth, scientific truth can change and can evolve. And so still it's not 100% proof, but it's a proof you can at least rely on. No? And what is an experiment in the spiritual sense? Now we see the scriptures say, Jesus says, we testify of what we know and of what we have seen, but you don't accept our testimony. So Jesus is also talking about this. He said, we testify of what we know and what we have seen. So what is Jesus talking about here? He's talking about experiments. He say we testify about things. We testify about things we know and we have seen. So in order to to have to have seen something, you need to make an experiment. You cannot talk about a dogma or a thesis to have seen something. In order you have seen something, you need to do the experiment, and then you see something, and because you have seen something, you can testify about it. And so, what is an experiment? Of course, in science, we all know what an experiment is. You, you make some arrangement, like a physical arrangement. I'm a physicist, I did study physics in the past. So you make an arrangement, like an apparatus, and this apparatus, it sends some electrons and some stuff, or some current. And because of this uh, arrangement, 
there's going to be some result. And out of the result, you can do a proof if the thesis is wrong or if it's right. And you can repeat the arrangement and you can re repeat the experiment. That's an experiment in physics. And in spirituality, what is an experiment? And also, you see, the, 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 the mistake that people make, they want to have a scientific uh, proof, uh, experiment and a scientific proof. And also in science, the things you trust, it hasn't been you who made the experiment. It has been some scientist, he made some experiment, he publishes the results, and you as an ordinary person, you trust that scientist. And in science, it's reasonable to trust that scientist because it's not some, it's not a matter about death or life. So you can, it's, it's safe to trust that scientist. But in spiritual terms, there's so much garbage. There's so much false religion. There's the Buddhists say this, the Muslims say this, the Christians say this. And they say, if you don't believe this, you go to eternal perdition and you need to do good works to get to heaven. There's so much contradiction, so you don't know, you cannot trust anyone. So there's a lot of lie and a lot of misuse and abuse. So it's, it's, you cannot just run, uh, trust any a pastor or an imam or some, or some guru. It's stupid to trust, just, just without reason to trust someone in this domain, it's stupid. And so the experiments you do in the spiritual, it's up to you to do the experiments. You can do the experiments in a, in a collective, and that's what we call church. If you do the experiment in a, in, a collect, in a collective, that's a church. Like if there's some pastor and there's some guy in a wheelchair, and the whole church prays for this guy in the wheelchair, and he gets healed, that's an experiment in a, in a bigger crowd. You can also do those experiments, but first you need to do the experiment on a personal level. And what does it mean to make an exper a spiritual experiment on a personal level? If we talk about Christianity, it means, yeah, well, well what does it mean? You, you just talk to God, no? If you want to find out if this guy whose name is, is God, he really does exist, you need to talk to him. That's an experiment. That's nothing else but an experiment. You just talk to him. And maybe you're going to hear something, but of course not with your ears, but in your fantasy you're going to hear something. Maybe you don't hear something, maybe some circumstances they're going to talk. Maybe there's going to happen something you didn't expect. Maybe there's going to happen something supernatural. And that's making an experiment. You say, you can say like, God, I don't know if you exist. So I'm making an experiment now. I'm talking to you, and if you don't exist, nothing's going to happen. But if you ex exist, and if you hear me, please let me experience you, let me encounter you, let me feel your love, or let me know that you exist. And that is nothing else than making an experiment. And only through the experiment comes the proof. Only through the experiment comes the truth, comes knowing the truth. Everything before the experiment is just a thesis, it's just a dogma, it's hypocrisy. It's nothing that is really true. And only by making experiments you can have true faith. You cannot have faith by just believing a dogma. You see, I've been a Christian for 19 years. I did read a lot about Christ Jesus healing people. And it was a thesis, it was a theory. I knew it was true. I knew he, he can do it, but it was a mere dogma, it was a mere theory, because I never had experienced Jesus healing someone. If there was no flesh on the bone, there was no flesh in my faith. I had theoretical faith that Jesus can heal someone, but no practical faith, and this was no faith. But faith has to be practical, everything else is not faith, it's just theory. So I had no faith God really does heal. Because I had no experience he does. And it came the point when I had a broken knee and I, in my naivety, I asked God for healing and he did heal my knee. Instantly, the Holy Spirit came into me, my knee. In two seconds, all my pain was gone. And I had a big shock. I was shocked. Because I never experienced something like this. I was afraid. I was like, what? This is not possible. This is a miracle. It was only some small thing. It was only my knee that hurt a little bit. But he, God did heal it supernaturally. 
And from that point on, I had faith God really can do this. And from that point on, I started exercising that faith. I started making other experiments and I started praying for people and they also got healed. And so my faith grew and grew and grew and grew because I made experiments and experiments and experiments. And the experiments always turned out the same, that God not really does heal when I pray. And so I grew in faith and I have faith that God can and does heal. And today I'm healing with people with cancer. It's, it's like eating breakfast because I grew in that faith. And so I finally, I, I gave you now a lot of theory, but let's start making experiments. Let's start practicing them. Because if you don't practice it, it's useless. And if you don't believe God exists, that's the first experiment you need to do. If that's the first practice you need to do to find out. And so we talk now to this God. And so let's pray to this God. And now God or Jesus, I thank you for life. I thank you that we all are all, all, all our life. I thank you we, we got this present of life and I thank you we are striving after the secrets of life and after wisdom, after the secrets of wisdom. And Jesus, I ask you, if, if it's really true you love us, and it's only a theory, a lot of Christians tell us we love us, and it's only a theory, Jesus, we need a proof. And it's legitimate to, to, uh, to request a proof, even though it can also be evil, but we ask you for a proof, Jesus. And Jesus, we, we ask you, you show us how much you love us. I ask you that we really can feel your love and not just the theory and some book we read. Jesus, I ask you that everyone who listens to this message, he's going to feel your love or see he's going to meet some guy who can show him your love so he can really feel it. And not from some human, but really from you, directly from you. Jesus, I ask you, you, you take a hug on everyone who is listening here and he really starts feeling your love. And he really knows your love is real and God is real. Because how do we know God is real? By the fruit. And what is the fruit? The fruit is love. We can only know it's God if it's love. And so we need to feel that love. Because everything else could be a trick. Could be, I don't know what, but if only the love is true. And so we need to experience that love. We need to feel that love. And God, I ask you for it. I ask you that those people who listen to this message, there comes the day when they start feeling your love out of nothing. And they start feeling your presence. And they start feeling you that you are real. And they experience it with their own feelings that it's not a fairy tale. It's, it's something very real, this God. And I ask you for this God. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, folks, that's my two buts for about the number 42 and about the secret of the purpose of life. Okay, thanks for listening and uh, I'm on Facebook if you want to contact me. My name on Facebook is simon.egli777. Uh, so you're welcome to contact me and if you have questions you can ask me questions and I'm happy to answer your questions and don't hesitate. Also if you need prayer, I'm also on Skype with the same name simon.egli777, I'm also on Skype. I do live in Nicaragua, I'm a missionary, if you want to come on vacation you're always welcome, if you want to make some vacation in Nicaragua, don't hesitate, uh, I have you know, a very nice family, you can live with that family. Very cheap for a hundred dollars a month with include, included food. You can live with that family. You can have a nice time here in Granada. Go for it. So uh, I, I would also be happy to meet you, folks. I, I love people. I'm happy to meet you. You're always welcome here. Okay. Have a nice day and God bless you and Jesus loves you and you're you're a diamond. Don't uh, don't be, uh, don't be satisfied with with uh, with breadcrumbs. You're nothing but a diamond. You're a chevel and you're, you have a beautiful heart. And Jesus sees the beautiful heart. Even, even if you have been treated badly in your life, you have been pushed down and you have been treated... Yeah, I don't know what happened in your life, but the truth is you are a diamond. You're a chevel. And Jesus, he has faith in you. He loves you and he sees the potential in you. He sees you like a beautiful flower. And you, he wants you to grow into that beautiful flower because that's what he created you for. And so he loves you and you are loved. You are a loved one. And you can love yourself. Why you can love yourself? Why you can accept yourself? Because you are loved and because you are accepted. 
And there might be a lot of humans, they don't love you, they don't accept you, but the truth is you are loved and you are accepted by your Heavenly Father, by the guy who created everything. By Him you are loved and accepted and that's the only thing that counts because He, he created in everything, He's in charge of everything. And if He decides you are, lo you are lovely, you are lovable, and He decides you're acceptable, then you are. Because He is the guy who decides what is truth and what is not true. He's in charge and if He loves you and He accepts you and He says you, you are lovable and you're acceptable because I love you and because I accept you, then you are. Because He is the truth. He is the one who created everything and He is the one who is the truth. And if He, he loves you, then it's the truth that you are loved. It's nothing but the truth. And if you say to yourself, well, I'm lovable, I'm, I'm acceptable, I love myself, and because I love myself, I'm lovable. Well, it's weak. It's something very weak, because who are you? If you decide it's the truth that you are lovable, because you love yourself, this, is, this has no power, it's something very weak. It is the truth, but the truth is not that you're lovable because you decide you love yourself. That is something totally weak. Because we are weak. We are nothing but dust. And we have been given mercy, and that's why we have a little power. Because we have been be given mercy by the power. We have been be, be given mercy by the true power, and that's we have a, why we have a little power. So those words when you say, I'm lovable because I decide for myself I'm lovable, and because I love myself, this has a little power, but this power has been given to you, and it can change a little bit. But if you rely on the true power, he says I'm lovable, and he decides if I'm lovable or not, and he loves me, and he, he says I'm lovable, and that's... I am lovable because he said so. And he's the truth. He, he created the whole universe. And so you're lovable. And it's the truth. And the truth has so much power. It has way more power than a, lot, a bunch of faith. The truth is the thing that has true power. The truth is the thing that moves the mountain with, with a faith of a mustard seed. Another, a, a, a huge mountain of faith to move a small, can only move a small mountain of problems. But a, a mustard seed of faith in, in a, a rock of truth can move any mountain in your life. <laughs> okay folks, thanks for listening. Have a nice day. Bye.